Good morning. Just wonderful to be in God's presence, isn't it? And uh, just be caught up in praising him and worshipping him. We're going to uh, start this morning, as, as James uh, has already said, um, a look at John chapter 1. And over the next six Sundays, we're going to work our way through the first 18 verses of John chapter 1. A passage that's often read around Christmas time, and I can remember hearing it frequently as a child around Christmas time, read in the King James Version. Um, and I can remember people telling me this is a very beautiful passage of English writing on a par with Shakespeare. Um, and I didn't understand it. So let's pray that God gives us understanding of it. If you've got uh, John, a uh, Bible with you, could you turn to John chapter 1? We're going to start by reading uh, verses 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. I just enjoy reading that passage. <laughs> it is, there's such a lot in it and it's um, so beautifully written. But I think the, the confusion I had as a child when hearing this was I had no idea what was meant by the word. I couldn't figure out, I couldn't make sense of the passage because right at the beginning, in the beginning was the word. What word? What word are you talking about? I, and I, I didn't get it. So we could have the next slide. So my confusion was about that. What does John mean? Next slide again, please. Who or what is the word? In verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god so what does john the writer of this apostle of this gospel mean it's a little bit confusing because there's two johns there's the john who wrote this and there's john the baptist who's referred to in this so two people called john here what does it mean well it becomes clearer as you read down through the passage in verse 14, 
we read that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. So if we look further down, we get a huge clue. The word is the son of God. The word is Jesus. Because John here is writing about Jesus. And then uh, John the Baptist said that this is the one I spoke about when I said he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now John the Baptist was older than Jesus but he's saying he was before me. He's implying that Jesus is more than just a human being. Verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So if we look at all these things and put them all together, we come to the conclusion that when John talks about the Word... He's talking about Jesus. He's using the word as a title for Jesus. And he does this again in the letter he wrote at the end of the New Testament on the next slide. At the beginning of 1 John, he uses the same title. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands and have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. At the beginning of his letter, John is saying to the people he's writing this letter to, I want to tell you about Jesus. I knew him. I was an eyewitness. I was around with him. I touched him. I held his arm. I heard him speak. I saw him do the miracles. And he uses again that title, Word of Life. And just in case you need any more persuasion, when John wrote the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible, he talks about uh, in his vision that he sees a rider on a white horse, a rider who is called Faithful and True. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Those are titles of Jesus. And then he goes on to say, the word is his name. So the word refers to Jesus. We're not talking about a, a written word as such. It is a title of Jesus. And that helped me an awful lot to understand what the passage was about. But now I want to ask the question, well, okay, the word is one of the titles of Jesus. Jesus has many titles, and this is one of them. But what does it mean for us? How is this relevant for us? Well, first of all, if we have the next slide, the title, the word, tells us that Jesus is powerful. John deliberately starts his gospel here in a way that reminds us of the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, the Bible begins by saying that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the book of Genesis starts with creation, when everything was made. Here in John's Gospel, John actually starts even before creation. And he says, in the beginning was the Word. And then he goes on to talk about creation. So he tells us, first of all, that Jesus is older than all of the universe. Jesus existed before anything else did. Jesus existed with God. He created the whole universe and then he was born as a human being roughly 2,000 years ago. But he existed way, way before that. He was involved in creating everything from the vast reaches of space the spectacular might of the stars and the universe, to the very smallest atoms and molecules. That's a picture. I'll explain that, those blue blobs. That is a photograph, which for me is an amazing photograph, of some protein molecules. Now, protein molecules are not just random blobby things. 
their shapes are really important because a very slight change in the shape of the molecule gives it different properties and it does different things. And when I learned that and studied that, I'm just amazed at the greatness of God. <laughs> that he makes what looks to us like a random blobby thing, but it's actually in a particular shape in order to perform a particular function. And if it's slightly twisted in its shape, it doesn't work, or it works differently. Now, these are obviously not to scale. <laughs> so what sizes are we talking about? Protein molecules are actually big, big, giant molecules. And we can just about take pictures of them, not with any ordinary kind of microscope or stuff, but with the most powerful electron scanning microscopes that exist. Atoms and most other molecules are far smaller than that, and we can't take pictures of them, they're too small. But how about those? Well, if we have the next slide, uh, those protein molecules are typically three to six nanometers, and you'll say, what's a nanometer? It's a thousand millionth of a meter. And you say, I don't get that really, neither do I, because it's beyond my ability to really think of something that small. How does that compare with the universe? Let's look at the next slide. The universe is 96 billion light years across, and one light year is 9.46 thousand trillion meters. Now, I, I, can't, I can't get a trillion. I can maybe just about get a thousand because I think of a football crowd and think, oh, you know, there's 20,000 at that football crowd. But a billion, a trillion rather, which is bigger than a billion, I can't understand how many that is. And one light year is 9.46, that's roughly 9,500 trillion metres, a metre's kind of that big, 1,000 trillion of them across, but the universe is 96 billion light years. I, these are numbers that kind of, we can't picture and we struggle with. But what I've shown them to you because what I want to show you is that God, Jesus, created all of it. These massive, big, vast stretches of the universe and the tiny, tiny shapes of molecules and things that make up all living things and who function with just the slightest change to them differently. Jesus made all of them. There is not a single thing that exists that was created by anyone or anything else. God, the Word, created the whole lot. But he didn't then kind of say, that's it, job done. I'm going to find some nice planet over here and sit down and just let them get along by themselves. And if they mess it all up, well, I can always start again. And maybe if I make human beings version two, they'll make a better job of it all. He didn't say that. Because the Bible tells us that he holds all things together. You can see this verse in Colossians here. In him, this is talking about Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things and in him all things hold together. The whole lot, this enormous universe, these tiny little atoms and molecules, they're held together by God, by Jesus. And he is working to hold them together. And in Hebrews chapter 1, the next slide, tells us that the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus, the word, is keeping everything going in the universe. He is actively involved today. Why? Because he cares for us. Because he loves what he created. Because he has not abandoned it. 
He sustains it all. He holds it all. And in Psalm 33, we read on the next slide that he spoke and it all came into existence. He commanded and it stood firm. So we have a connection there. We see that God created everything by speaking. If you read the first chapter of Genesis, it says, God said, let there be light. God said, let this, let that. God said, and out of nothing, it came into being. How does that happen? I don't know. I can't explain it. But I do believe it. God, the word, Jesus. What does this mean then to us? Next slide. Well, first of all, it means, it tells us that God is powerful. That God is more powerful than our minds can comprehend. He designed and made the intricacy and complexity of the chemistry which sustains life. But he also set the stars in space. He did it all by speaking his word. And he holds it all together. Nothing and nobody are more powerful than God. Secondly, on the next bit... It says that it tells us that he's continuing to work every second of every day. He loves us and cares for us. He's holding it all together. He's sustaining it. He is the ultimate power and authority. And then thirdly, on the next slide, sorry, we're going off the bottom of the slides here, tells us that when everything around us is unstable and shaking, when we see some countries trying to exert their power over others, when we see governments changing at regular intervals, when we see the climate getting warmer, when we see people travelling across continents to find a better place to live, when basic necessities are getting more expensive, we, as Christians, have the reassurance and peace that comes from knowing deep in our hearts that God, who is all-powerful, and who knows what is going on, is in control. He is our rock. He is our refuge. He is our hiding place. So this term, the word, tells us that God is powerful, and that is important and relevant to us in an unshaking, sorry, in a shaking and uncertain world. He is the one we can turn to. Secondly, The word tells us that God is personal. If we have that next slide, but Aaron, that God is personal. Words are a means of communication from one person to another. On the next slide, we use words to communicate to each other. And on the next slide, the word communicate can mean a whole range of things convey, transmit, tell, impart, pass on, transfer, and so on. You can read some of them up there. And words have power. Next slide again. Words have power. I I don't know whether you were told, like I was, when I was at school and people started teasing me and calling me names, I was told this little rhyme. You remember it? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. Words will never hurt me. Words can hurt. Words have power. And words have authority. If we look at the Bible on the next slide, God promised to Moses that he would raise up a prophet who would speak God's word to his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, he, God says to Moses, I will raise up them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. God communicated to his people through prophets by giving the prophets his words. So, for example, we see in the beginning of Jeremiah. Next slide, please. In Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah writes about his calling from God and he says, The Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put 
my words in your mouth. In the New Testament, God speaks to people again. And on the next slide, oh, those are about the prophets. Okay, next slide after that. Uh, When Jesus was baptised, the people around heard a voice from heaven. Speak down, the voice of God saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then later on, at what we call the transfiguration, when Jesus went up on a mountain with Peter, James and John, and they saw Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah. And uh, on the next slide, please, Aaron. Uh, They hear again a voice from heaven saying something very similar, but with a little addition. God says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Because Peter was talking, kind of nervously talking. And God says, no, listen, listen to my words. Hear my words. God speaks personally to us. Um, In uh, his, sorry, Wayne Grudem, in his uh, big book about theology, says this. He says, among the members of the Trinity, it is especially God the Son who in his person, as well as in his words, has the role of communicating the character of God to us and of expressing the will of God for us. So if you want to know what God is like, next slide again, please. Uh, If you want to know what God's will is, if you want to know what God's purposes are, we need to look to Jesus. We need to read about Jesus. We need to ask Jesus. We need to listen to Jesus. We need to develop a close relationship with Jesus. Jesus speaks to us today. Next slide, please. Primarily, he speaks to us through the Bible. First and foremost, through the Bible. The Bible is not a textbook. It's the Word of God. The Word of God is a title of Jesus. So what that means is that when we read the Bible, we are meeting with a person. We're meeting with Jesus. And it is good practice, I believe, that before we read the Bible, whenever we do, that we ask that God would open our ears so that we would hear what he has to say to me today. God speaks through the Bible. The Bible is living. It's not a dull, dry set of words on pieces of paper. And we can speak back to Jesus in prayer, communicating with him. So God does speak to us in other ways, I know, prophetic words, godly advice from brothers and sisters in Christ, dreams and visions, sometimes even through circumstances. But the most common and most reliable way God speaks to us is through the Bible. And if any apparent word from God we get from some other source is, contradicts what the Bible says, then that word is not correct. So what does that mean to us? Next slide, please. First of all, it tells us that God wants to communicate with us. He wants us to get to know him. And the next slide. Secondly, it tells us that the best way to get to know God is to spend time with him, to listen to him. And the next slide. Thirdly, we spend time with him by reading the Bible and meditating on it. By meditating, I'm not talking about some strange, weird Eastern thing. Uh, I'm talking about thinking about what the Bible says deeply. Meditating on it. Praying, worshipping and praising God. And meeting with other Christians. So the word tells us that God is powerful. The word tells us that God is personal and thirdly and finally, the word is, tells us also that God makes us promises. We make promises by using words. Next slide. Around 4,000 years ago, God made a promise to a man called Abraham. You can read it in Genesis. He promised Abraham that he would have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And he promised this several times to Abraham through his life. The promise was repeated to his son Isaac, 
to Isaac's son Jacob, and then God renamed Jacob Israel, which is why the people in the country are called Israel. Next slide, please. About 3,000 years ago, God made a promise to King David of Israel. He promised King David that, that a descendant of his would rule on the throne forever and ever. About 2,700 years ago, next slide, the prophet Isaiah expanded on this and told us a little bit more about it. Next slide again. He said, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That was 700 years or so before Jesus was born. And then, next slide please, Jesus came. Jesus, the word of God. He is the one promised long ago. He is the one who fulfills all the promises that God made. You may have received a promise from God yourself. God is a personal God. He knows about you. He cares for you. And sometimes he makes promises to us. We need to distinguish between uh, what I would call two types of promise. There are promises in the Bible which we can 100% trust. There is a different type of promise, perhaps it's not in the Bible, but not contradicting the Bible. But we need to be more cautious about this. So I'm, I'm talking about things like when somebody says, I believe God has promised that I'm going to marry that person. We might be right, we might be wrong. Because it doesn't tell you in the Bible who you're going to marry. You know? Unfortunately, there's no verse that says you are going to marry this person. But where the Bible does give us promises, like cast all your anxieties on him for he cares about you, we can trust that totally. We can take our anxieties to God and give them to him and he will give us peace. So, let's just conclude. John begins his gospel talking about Jesus. The word means Jesus. He starts before creation was made, before the universe existed, and then John brings us swiftly through creation to the time when Jesus lived on earth as a man. And he's talking about Jesus when he talks about the word of God. Jesus, the word of God, is, uh, <clears throat> next slide, first of all, powerful. He created everything. He holds it all together. He is involved today and he is in control. In a troubled world, we can look to him for peace. Secondly, Jesus is personal. He speaks to us, he communicates with us, and he wants a relationship with us. And thirdly, Jesus is the fulfillment of all God's promises. Promises in the Bible we can trust completely. Promises we feel given to us personally, we hold with an open hand and look to him. So just that one phrase, the word of God, tells us a huge amount about God and about Jesus. <laughs>